Okay, folks, if you don't mind, I think it's uh, 10 after, and um, I'd like to get started if that's okay with all of you. Um, so I'm just going to mention a couple of things before we actually get into the, today's lecture. So the first thing is, um, if you have not received your grade or your evaluation from the last uh, tutorial quiz, can you let me know as soon as possible? The following Monday, this Monday, you will go to the same uh, room and the same tutorial time that you went to the last week unless you um, have indicated that you needed to change your tutorial time. And uh, you'll be staying with that TA and that group for the remainder of the uh, semester. So I'm hoping that you'll continue to do as well as I've been told by your TAs that all of you have been doing. Um, so your reading this week will be just a little bit longer uh, and it will be the same format and you'll have some um, questions based on the readings that you've had. So now that you've gone through it once, I'm hoping that uh, the next iteration will be even better for you. Okay, so I'm going to uh, go back and talk to you a little bit about the microbiome. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about how the microbiome starts to colonize your gut in the first place and then talk, you, talk to you through uh, a number of situations that result in changes to our human biology. Why it changes, how it changes, why that uh, might be a bad thing. So we're going to go back and revisit some of the concepts, some of the ideas, and expand just a little bit on some of these um, as we go along. Uh, I'm going to tell you to concentrate on things related to adaptation. When you're going through, and I'm hoping that you've been staying on top of doing the three by three, like one interesting thing, one confusing thing, and then three slides that you should um, make sure that you go back and review. For today, I'm going to tell you in advance that you should really make sure that you understand slide 14 in the slide deck, uh, 17 as well as 18. And those are ones that you will see in some shape or form on your um, midterm. Um, in terms of antibiotics, we take a lot of them. And you are eating antibiotics whether you think you're eating antibiotics or not. So every time you are theoretically in theory. Every time you are eating meat, for example, you are actually eating something that has come in contact with antibiotics. And that's actually um, impacting human biology quite a bit. And uh, we are seeing more and more resistance to antibiotics, maybe because of those reasons, and we'll uh, eventually get to that uh, down the road. So this is the paper that we are aiming for, um, probably by next Friday, and, and next Friday uh, we'll be sort of wrapping up the microbiome before moving on into a um, different uh, topic altogether. So before we get into um, whether or not fiber is actually beneficial for you and um, increases the diversity of your gut microbiome and the gut microbiota, I wanted to go back and um, revisit a couple of things. So all of these things, whether it's your lifestyle, how you behave as students, what you decide to do as students, um, whether you're engaged in active exercise, whether or not you're taking antibiotics for whatever uh, reason, um, how you change your diet and whether you change your diet um, is important, and the types of hygiene. So we're exposed to bacteria all the time uh, through a number of different routes, like uh, your, through your diet, um, you can change your bacteria, your hygiene as well. And all of this is what we're going to be looking at today, how the intestinal microbiome uh, tends to get altered. And if the intestinal microbiome does get altered, what are the consequences of those types of changes? Well, one consequence that we are becoming more aware of, one potential consequence, is um, that you might um, actually start to see that metabolic syndrome that we saw earlier on. You might actually, through changing your gut microbiome, also cause this metabolic dysfunction. There is some indication in the literature, and I'll take you through one um, aspect of this today, and again, you'll go through it in your tutorial on Monday, that maybe inflammation in general might result from an altered uh, gut microbiome, and it might be through things like hyperimmunity, it may be specific factors like cytokines, like interleukin-6 and interleukin-12, or TNF-alpha that your gut microbiome is producing in bigger or more quantities than you would normally expect uh, to have. It, might, it may be the exact opposite. You may not be producing as much of the anti-inflammatory interleukin-10 um, as you normally have. But regardless of that, right now our strategy is going to be identical to what we looked at when we talked about the skin. In the skin, we said that when you use drugs like benzoyl peroxide, you use Accutane, 
you use things that clean up or dry out your skin, that's not necessarily the best approach to doing things. And that maybe one way is to actually seed your skin with bacteria that normally is found on nice healthy skin. And maybe one way to think about altering all of these different health effects, whether it is um, metabolic dysfunction or inflammation, maybe another way to do this is by seeding our intestinal microbiome, our intestinal microbiota, the bacteria, uh, in a different way, similar to what we looked at on the skin. Many of you have already engaged in those types of things. Many of you um, already eat yogurt. Uh, many of you are taking in, uh, I forget what they're called. If you go to the uh, Asian market, you see these little bottles of, um, it kind of looks like milk, but it doesn't taste like milk. That, that in itself is something that uh, gets, uh, it is a form of altering your gut microbiome. And I'll, I'll try to get some of that for the next lecture so you can try it out yourself. Um, as you'd expect, when we take a look at the gut microbiome, the, the gut bacteria are mainly anaerobic. There's no, in theory, there is no air uh, for these bacteria in your gut. There shouldn't be um, a lot of air in your gut. And these are, as a result, anaerobic. And we think we have a, somewhere on the order of about 500 to um, 1,000 different uh, bacterial species that live within uh, the gut. Just try to get the laser pointer, apologies on that. Um, and again, overall though, the, the number of bacteria that we have, although we have lots of different species, the phyla, we have a very small number of phyla and we'll go through about three or four of those uh, in today's lecture. So the most abundant types of these phyla are the uh, bacterioides, which are gram negative rods. And I mentioned very briefly the difference between how we do the gram staining for the shape of the different bacteria. And these are gram negative rods. You don't have to worry about how the stain is done or anything else, as well as the firmicutes, which are gram positive. So we have both gram negative and gram positive uh, uh, rods that live in our gut. And these help us under different um, circumstances. There are other, others um, as well, proteobacteria um, and actinobacteria in particular, and we'll hear about all of these as we go along uh, in uh, this series as we wrap up the gut microbiome. Just like the skin, we have different um, quantities of bacteria and different populations of bacteria in different parts of our GI tract. We don't have very many sort of in the um, esophagus, for example. Uh, you do have bacteria living on your teeth, as many of you will know. But if we take a look, there's a couple of um, trends that I wanted to uh, point out for you here on this particular um, slide. So overall, we have somewhere between 500 and 1,000 different um, species of bacteria that live in your GI tract. And this is the GI tract that we're going to be taking a look at, everything from your stomach all the way down to your large intestine, the duodenum, jejunum, and ileum being parts of your small intestine. So if you take a look in your stomach, generally speaking, unless you are very, very ill or you're immunocompromised, we don't have a lot of bacteria uh, there. Uh, we have about uh, 10 to the second to 10 to the third. And again, the numbers are not important. Please don't memorize the numbers. What I want you to realize though, is as we go from the stomach through parts of the small intestine, the duodenum, jejunum, and ileum as the small intestine, uh, we start to increase the numbers of bacteria that we have found in those different parts of the GI tract. By the time we get into the large intestine, the colon, as well as the appendix, we have many, many more um, uh, bacteria living in living here than we did up in the stomach. Okay, so that's the first trend that I wanted you to be aware of. We have many, many more organisms living uh, all the way down in the large intestine than we do in the stomach. The other thing that I wanted you to be aware of, in different parts of your um, of your GI tract, we have uh, different types of bacteria. And this is one that we're going to see several times today that I'd like you to be aware of. One is lactobacillus or lactobacilli as the plural. And we see this primarily in the upper parts of the GI tract system. So we see it in the stomach uh, and parts of the duodenum. And as we go further down into the small intestine, for example, then we start to see other bacterial species coming up. So we still see lactobacillus, uh, but we also start to see streptococcus. Okay, so the cocci, um, the coccus being those round uh, bacteria that we saw in the last lecture. 
And if we go even further down into the large intestine and the end of the small intestine, you'll see that we have a tremendous explosion of different types of bacterial species. We still have the lactobacillus, but we start to see clostridium uh, appearing. We start to see the enterobacteria, enterobacteria the enterococcus um, fecalis, uh, the uh, bacterioids and the bacterioidetes. Um, many, many different species are there with that explosion in the numbers of the bacteria. Okay, so we have diversity and we have a difference, a gradient from the top to the bottom of our GI tract system. Do you have any questions on this before we go on? So the numbers again over here on the right are not important. Um, it's just that the increase in the numbers that we see that is a trend that I want you to be aware of. I want you to be aware if you haven't already gotten it in your um, physiology or anatomy classes, the, the small intestinal uh, divisions like the duodenum, jejunum, and ileum, and then the large intestine labeled here as the uh, colon. And of course on the left, uh, the increase in diversity, including the, the names of the different bacteria that you see here um, on the top, you don't have to memorize all the ones that you see down here on the bottom. Any questions before we go on? No questions at all? Yes, you have a question. Sorry? I think, uh, I think the way that you're asking the question is, are those related to uh, lactose intolerance? Is that your question? Um, they, they do in a sense. Uh, can they help you with lactose uh, digestion? Yes, so lactose is a sugar that um, you, would, uh, uh, you would take in sugar and then it would be broken down into things like um, galactose, fructose, as well as uh, lactose. And then if you are lacking, if you have a uh, lactose um, uh, intolerance, then one of the things that happens is in the small intestine, you actually don't have the lactase enzyme you can't break down lactose, and so the lactose stays all the way through to the large intestine where the bacteria can help to digest it and produce gases which cause that bloating as well as everything else. We're gonna talk a lot about poop today, so it's good that you got that out of the way. Thank you. Okay, um, so in terms of the gut microbiota, uh, and that's the different bacterial species. Uh, bacteria are the dominant species. Yes, we do have viruses that live there. Yes, we do have, um, you, uh, we have uh, prokaryotic organisms that live there uh, in addition to the bacteria, but bacteria dominate in the um, GI tract. And the major divisions of these bacteria uh, include things like the uh, bacterioidetes as well as the firmicutes. And, this is an important concept for you to make sure that you go back and make sh and, and know. Uh, and it seems that even though we have a lot of different bacteria, that if you look, just like with the skin, if you look between individuals, between um, male, female, or different individuals in this class, that even though we all have slightly different gut microbiota, the types of bacteria that live within us, um, we tend to have them dominated by these two different types. And in addition, if we further subdivide these major divisions into the enterotypes, then we can see that out of all of us in this room, it's likely that we have different proportions of bacterioids, uh, Prevotella uh, and or Ruminococcus. And you all have these bacteria growing in you, but the ratios of them might be different. Some of you might be like really fit, you might have one um, type, versus another, but we all have sort of the same uh, types just like we did on the skin. And the, the ratios are all that are going to be different. As I mentioned to you before, and we're gonna start on this process today, from the time that you were born and the, until now, your gut has undergone three um, massive extinctions and changes in the types of bacteria that live within them. As long as you stay healthy, and as long as your diet is relatively stable, it will stay that way until you reach sort of the end of that um, pie chart on the right. When you start getting older, 
um, there are also going to be some changes uh, to your gut microbiome as well. But we have a lot of stability in this uh, period right now, and we're going to talk about this transition that you make from the time that you're born and how you're born into the types of bacteria that you have right now as an adult and how that might change when you get uh, to be a little bit older. Now, other things are going to affect your gut microbiome along the way. Uh, whether or not you take in different um, supplements, whether you take in different vitamins, whether you're on antibiotics. Antibiotics wipe out your gut microbiome. Does it come back? Well, if you, if you erase, for example, your fingerprint, like you filed it down, will your fingerprint come back in exactly the same way? More or less, yes, but there might be some changes that come along with it. So are, are these things, as they change, going to cause other issues with your human biology? Uh, they will. And those are things that we're going to talk a little bit about today. And we're not going to worry about these um, larger uh, microorganisms that you see up here. We're really going to concentrate on the bacterial side of things uh, as we go along. Do you have any questions about this? Okay, so I told you that this occurs if you are nice and healthy. And again, all of you are nice and healthy, and if everything is going along well, um, you will never enter into what is known as dysbiosis. And dysbiosis is the normal microbi uh, microbiota, the bacteria that live inside of your gut. Um, if it goes out of balance, those ratios that I mentioned to you earlier, and we haven't talked about it a lot yet, we will in the next few slides, if they start to go out of whack, then you are in trouble, right? And this is sort of this idea of what dysbiosis is. Um, and this is one of those definitions that I want you to make sure that you can write out. Um, if you're asked to write out a definition, um, this is a really good one for what uh, dysbiosis is, an imbalance of the normal uh, microbiome. So the bacteria, viruses, and the other eukaryotic organisms and other prokaryotic organisms, more or less, as long as you are nice and healthy, stay pretty stable. Just like on your skin, we saw that they stay nice and stable. It might be a little bit different um, on your face. It might be a little bit different on your arm. But overall, the populations on your skin stay stable, and so do the uh, populations that stay within your gut. However, as I mentioned, if you are um, changing your diet, and if you have a disease condition, your gut microbiome, even though it's not directly affecting your gut, may also be impacted on this. If you are on antibiotics, it will be um, also affected. Um, depending on environmental effects, your gut microbiome may also be affected as well. As I mentioned, I'm not gonna concentrate on the other aspects of the uh, microbiome, but just for completion's sake, um, if you look at the gut virome, all the viruses that live within your gut, 95% of them stay pretty stable throughout your adult lifehood, uh, lifetime as well. So it's not just the bacteria. We like having our microorganisms um, in balance, in other words, or at the appropriate level. And these are also going to change uh, with diet. So this becomes one of those issues. Um, you know, in human biology, what are the types of things that impact us? I showed you that slide at the very beginning. Things like exercise, your lifestyle, whether or not you're um, hygienic or non-hygienic, um, or that person who's serving you food over at um, Sid Smith caf Cafeteria is hygienic or non-hygienic. All of these things will directly impact uh, whether or not uh, your microbiome stays nice and healthy. So in biology, one of the things that we do is we try to model these different things. So in, in mice models, when you take mice, and we're going to talk about this some more next week, if you shift the mice diet from uh, a low-fat plant polysaccharide-based diet to something that is high-fat as well as high-sugar, and again, it's called in, in the uh, science uh, paper by Turnbaugh um, as a westernized diet. Um, they were able to detect in the mouse feces a change in the bacterial content within a day. So can the mic microbiome change, the ratios of the different uh, bacteria? Yes, within a day. Uh, and again, that's in mice. There are a lot of caveats. By the way, when we read these papers, um, we tend to uh, look at mice models and we go, wow, mice models, therefore it should be translatable into humans. 
in terms of diet and in terms of things related to the gut microbiome, that has been a long time in coming. So this is a 2011 paper, and there are other papers as well. It's not 100% translatable. What we see in mice is not always equal to what we see in humans. So keep all of this sort of in mind. So again, just as a sort of follow-up, as a human study, and by the way, it has not been replicated. It has not been um, something that has been shown uh, to be definitive. And this is a fairly old paper now, five years old. Um, in human studies, when they did something similar and they uh, looked at the fecal content of individuals, when they shifted their diet to something that was higher in carbohydrates, higher in fat, they were also able to show that they changed their gut microbiome. So again, not replicated, a science paper, really high impact, uh, but it suggests that if it's happening in mice, that you can change your gut microbiome in humans simply by changing your diet. Do you like that story? Do you believe that story? Kind of believe that story? It kind of makes sense, right? And it's published in science. Um, so, so maybe uh, it makes sense. Um, so this high fat diet, when you switch over, the bacterioids tend to dominate. So they're the ones that suddenly now, in response to having lots of fat in your diet, the bacterioids, which have been at a lower level, now start to uh, creep up. Um, and in a carbohydrate-rich diet, the Prevotella uh, also tend to dominate a little bit more. So yes, you can change your diet. And yes, you can see a change in the ratios of these different uh, types of um, bacteria. Do you have any questions about this before we go on? No? Okay, so before we go back to um, looking at changes in diet and changes in the gut microbiome, um, I wanted to actually go back and talk to you a little bit about where did all of these bacteria come from in the first place, right? So. If we take a look, and there, this is still controversial, um, and actually I was reading a few papers uh, last week related to this. In utero, there's a lot of controversy as to whether or not in utero, um, as you are developing in your mother's womb, whether or not that environment is completely sterile. That's a, it's a brand new concept because we think, or we used to think that in utero, in the womb, there shouldn't be any bacteria. And so some researchers though have actually suggested that even in utero, before you are born, that one of the things that might happen is that the amniotic fluid that is bathing you might also have some bacteria. Now, Again, it has, it's, a, it's a source of controversy right now in human biology uh, and in physiology, and we're not really sure uh, about this, but we're, we're going to go with the um, idea that the amniotic fluid in the next few slides is actually not a place where we have a lot of bacteria, but I wanted to um, at least get that out there uh, for you. Um, meconium, how many of you have heard of meconium? It's like a brand new element in the periodic table, right? Meconium, right after uranium, no. right near titanium. Yes, no, agree, disagree? Agree with me at the back? No, D D sorry? You've heard of it, okay. Um, what have you heard of it? And you have a really loud voice, by the way. Nice. Yes, the very, the very first poop that the baby has. Congratulations. Nice. Okay, thank you. Um, so the meconium is actually something that tells us a little bit about a baby's health and whether or not the baby is healthy. Um, I don't think most of you have children, um, so let me, let me just share a story with you. Um, the, the first time uh, I saw meconium, Although I've read a lot about meconium, don't ask me why I read a lot about meconium, but the first time I saw it, like I, I was really freaked out because we just brought our kid home from the hospital and um, we were changing her diaper and we thought, you know, she hasn't really eaten yet. And so what is she possibly going to, what's possibly going to come out of her body? And I was kind of telling my wife, you know, hey, I'm a, I'm a U of T prof. Trust me, there's going to be this thing called meconium coming out of our kid. Um, and then my wife called me over and she said, look at this. 
I, I looked and it was like tar, right? And it looks nothing like what it does in the textbooks. And um, I was like freaking out and I was like, is my baby okay? Like it, this is like really sticky, gooey, black stuff. Yes, it's, it's, it's one of those ew type of moments. Um, so this meconium though actually tells you if your baby is healthy. Um, and if you take a look at this meconium, this, this is actually in most cases free of viruses and we have very, very few bacteria, which suggests when, when you collect meconium or when scientists collect meconium, that in the amniotic fluid, if this is the first thing that's been passing through the digestive tract, that um, there shouldn't be a lot in the amniotic fluid. So this is why there are some controversies. Some scientists detect it in the amniotic fluid and other scientists don't detect it or don't detect a lot of it in the meconium, which tends to be relatively free of viruses as well as bacteria. Um, this also, again, just as a side note, but a side note that you should make sure that you know um, is actually important because if one of the things that you will learn as a as future parents is that you actually have to be on the lookout for that first poop because if your baby doesn't pass that first poop, it actually tells you about possible um, issues. So that meconium, if it doesn't appear, actually might say that your child has Hirschsprung's disease because they don't have the proper nervous system control of the um, movement of the um, of the gut to allow for expulsion. And this is Hirschsprung's disease is where it's congenital, it's genetic in origin, and it means that the colon becomes expanded, but it doesn't contract normally. It's aganglionic. There's no nervous system uh, control um, of this. And they have chronic constipation for the rest of their lives as a result, because some of their nerves, particularly the nerves that control contraction in our box uh, nerve plexus um, are not developed. Okay, so I'm gonna move on to this slide, unless you have any questions. Any questions? I'm willing to take any questions. Meconium, kids, life, birds and the bees, as well as bacteria. Um, so you're gonna see this slide again, um, I think on Monday, when you go to your tutorial. Uh, this is an important slide for you to know, as I mentioned at the outset, this should be one of your three by three slides, the, the three slides that you set aside to make sure that you spend time memorizing, understanding, as well as um, reviewing. So we think one of the things that happens, and I'm not gonna go through all of the details on this slide, um, right now. The most important ones, again, are over here on the left and in, in these gre green or bluish green um, boxes, is that during pregnancy, we think, and again, it's controversial, we think that um, the GI tract in utero of the baby is sterile. And that right around the time of birth, depending on the type of birth that you have, whether it's vaginal delivery or a C-section, actually determines the types of bacteria that will colonize the baby's gut. Okay, so if you are passing through and going um, and being delivered vaginally, the bacteria that tend to dominate as soon as you're born, at the time that you're born over the first few months, will actually be that lactobacillus. Remember, lactobacillus is there in the stomach, it's there in the intestine, it's there in the large uh, intestine as well. And in addition, you might have um, Prevotella as well as Snethia uh, in your gut to begin with. Now, if you are born by C-section though, and individuals have gone and checked this, uh, you actually start off at birth with a very different gut microbiome than someone who has been born uh, vaginally. And you will start off with Staphylococcus. You will start off with things like Carinobacterium uh, as well as uh, Propionibacterium uh, uh, to begin with. Can you think of a reason why? Where have you seen those before? Have you seen those before? Yes, no, maybe. So we saw that in the skin lecture. So we saw, for example, some of these different types of bacteria that are found on your skin. And when you are being born through C-section, where um, you are actually cutting open and going through the uterus, the bacteria that will colonize your gut, the baby's gut, are very different uh, than the gut uh, back, back, um, the gut microbiome um, after vaginal delivery. So again, our gut microbiomes may start off differently. However, um, over the first few months of birth though, um, overall the enterobacteria tend to dominate. 
However, once we start getting into the one to six month stage, uh, here we start to see those bacterioids um, dominating as well as bifido uh, bacteria dominating. As soon as you start eating solid food, when you are starting to be weaned and now you're taking in solid food, more carbohydrates, etc., and the environment changes for them, then we get into sort of the uh, bacterioids as well as the firmicutes. So we started off with this population, we moved into enterobacteria and this bifidobacteria, and then we get into these bacterioids and firmicutes, those three changes that I mentioned to you earlier. Now, those bacterioids and firmicutes are the ones that should, in theory, follow you throughout the rest of your life. However, as you see on the right-hand side, in adulthood, where you're sitting right now, so all throughout your um, early childhood into your teenage years, you've had varying um, co uh, combinations of uh, bacterioides as well as firmicutes in your digestive tract, but things can happen in your adulthood. So for example, um, you might start developing allergies. And if you're someone who has lots of allergies, uh, the proteobacteria may start to dominate um, and move away from this sort of balance between the bacterioides and firmicutes. Um, if you are on antibiotics, for example, you will dramatically decrease the population of the bacterioids uh, overall in your um, in your uh, gut, and you can see the changes that occur also in things like obesity. In obesity, the bacterioids uh, and the bacterioides tend to decrease, and the uh, firmicutes tend to increase increase and as a result of this change in this balance that you normally have here in adulthood um, with obesity then you will also change the cytokine production from uh, the immune system response as well so interleukin 1 uh, beta goes up which is a cytokine as well as TNF alpha and again on the opposite side of um, allergies uh, as part of maybe an autoimmune disease uh, the firmicutes and um, the uh, bacterioids fragilis will also change in their ratio. So your health, your biology changes in relation to your diet, it changes in relation to the drugs that you're taking, it changes in relation to your, your allergic state, it changes in relation to almost anything. If we believe those two papers that I showed you earlier from science, translational medicine, and from science, that these changes can occur within a day. And we're not sure if that actually occurs within a day or not. Um, in humans, it's a little harder to say. How many of you um, have uh, heard of probiotics? How many of you take probiotics? Like you routinely eat probiotics. And after you started, has that helped you? Yes, no? Haven't noticed any changes? And it's really hard to uh, say if, for example, you do that Activia Challenge. I don't know if you remember that from a few years ago. Did you watch that on TV? Take the Activia Challenge, buy Activia, take it for a couple of weeks, see if you get any better or you feel any better. Did any of you take that challenge? No? Not up for a challenge? Yes? Any of you up for a challenge? I'll feed you for two weeks. Up for a challenge? Sure? Okay, let's do it. Okay, so if you're up for it, I will feed you yogurt for the next two weeks. Um, by the way, I'm sorry, I don't, I don't uh, really believe in sort of the whole name brand thing, so I had to go with uh, President's Choice. So, yes, I see a big President's Choice fan at the back. Um, but it is, in theory, it's all um, probiotic, says so right at the top. Really... Uh, healthy, I guess, if you believe in that sort of thing. It may change your, whoever is interested in taking part. I do have spoons for you, too. Did you get them all? No, you don't get to eat them all. <laughs> like, um, I think probably spread it around a little bit to anyone else that might be interested. Um, in any case, one of the things that I want you to be aware of are these changes that occur within your um, bacteria. So... I want you to think about this. You are losing a lot of these bacteria every single day. If you believe some of those um, papers that are out there that says that your fecal matter is about 50% bacteria that's coming out of your gut every time you go to the washroom, uh, you are killing billions to trillions of these bacteria over the course um, of your lifetime. You're changing your um, gut microbiome. Uh, and again, this virome uh, seems to be uh, a little bit different in terms of um, what we see. Um, the viral sequences from the time of birth over the course of the second week of um, 
of development in children uh, doesn't seem to be um, uh, as quick, um, and the reported changes are only about 56%. Uh, percent. And those early bacterial colonizers, like the lactobacilli that I mentioned, tend to be aerobic. So those are the ones that we find up higher in the um, GI tract, where you do have more air coming down along with your food, and they tend to be um, more uh, aerobic, and these are likely coming from those maternal sources as you have that um, vaginal uh, delivery. And again, around one to two years of age, after you have started eating regular food, your um, bac bacterial fingerprint, your microbiome, your microbiota tends to be relatively stable as long as nothing else uh, is going on. Okay, so. Um, I'm going to mention this in passing now. You're actually going to have to revisit this on Monday when you start looking at um, sort of antibiotic uh, resistance in your gut. And one of the things that we know is if you are taking antibiotics for a variety of reasons. Um, so when I was younger, I had like terrible health. So um, I had all sorts of um, different antibiotics that I was put on. And overall, um, it probably uh, changed the course of my own gut microbiome quite um, substantially. So uh, when I was really young, I had a, a lung infection um, because I liked playing out in the cold. I had um, sort of uh, a, a form of pneumonia that, that had to be treated with antibiotics. And as a result of that, I was on antibiotic treatment for a very, very long period um, of time. And this antibiotic use will definitely affect your gut microbiome. It's designed to kill bacteria. Your gut has bacteria. And so it's very... Um, efficient at wiping out your gut microbiome. The, the yogurt, by the way, the probiotic, before we engineered it, because you have to think about it. Someone actually had to sit there, design bacteria that could survive going through your GI tract, because where do you want it to sit? If you were going to design bacteria to impact your gut microbiome, where should they end up? Where should they colonize? Yes, your gut. What part of your gut? The large intestine. So they have to travel through your stomach, your small intestine, and then they have to survive enough to be able to colonize your gut. So originally, when you were on antibiotics in the 1970s, your doctor told you, well, go, go and eat some yogurt to um, get things going um, after you're on antibiotics. But we know that even after you discontinue antibiotic use, a lot of those taxonomic groups just don't recover. D don't worry, there's more coming. It, it's OK. Um, so a lot of these groups actually don't recover. Even though your bacteria grow back, not all of the ones that you had will grow back. Um, so we know that there is a, a huge impact on um, the gut microbiome in this way. Um, the other thing that's really important about this is that there is a reduced resistance um, of the resident bacteria um, to these antibiotics. And that means that if a foreign bacteria comes in, they have a better chance of colonizing it now. And so this redu reduced resistance through this antibiotic use um, can actually impact you directly. And it, it is actually a really um, big thing. Your gut is designed to be able to withstand a lot of this. And I'm going to um, go through this really quickly now. I'm going to come back to it because this is another important diagram and I'm going to come back to it um, on Monday as well. You have a number of things that your gut is actually designed to protect you from. If, you, if, if the bacteria that is normally part of the lumen, so all this stuff here, so if your gut is a tube and you have bacteria growing in the middle of the tube or along the sides of the walls of the tube, and this is the uh, side of the wall of the tube, if it goes inside the tube, it's actually disastrous. And so if, for example, any of the little bacterial rods that you see up here make it inside, inside the um, actual wall of the gut, there are a number of defense mechanisms that come into play. So we have physical barriers like mucus um, on the surface of the uh, GI tract to prevent bacteria from crossing. But if any of them happen to breach that muc uh, the mucosal lining, um, the epithelial cells that line the gut also produce antimicrobial proteins, or AMPs. So they're also there as a line of defense. 
um, any of those commensal, normally occurring bacteria that happen to make it across are also going to be eliminated as quickly as possible by tissue resident macrophages. So there's an immune system built directly into the walls of the GI tract um, system. Um, there are also dendritic cells in addition to these uh, macrophages. So we have a number of these different um, sort of defense mechanisms that are at play all the time. So, and again, I'll come back to this and go through this in a little bit more detail um, on Monday. Um, so uh, we also have other immune responses and all of these things uh, lead to us being able to defend against um, bacteria coming into our blood system and that through the GI tract. So even though we have a lot of bacteria that's growing in us and we think that it impacts our health, if any of those bacteria that are growing in us normally were to work their way into um, our tissues, it would actually be disastrous. So it's kind of like um, a, an arm's length relationship. You, you want them, but you don't want them too close and part of your tissue. And this mucosal firewall acts sort of as that arm's length uh, protection that we'll go through in some more detail on Monday. Okay, did you have any questions about this before I go on? Just out of curiosity, how many of you um, take M250 or have taken M250? Some of you? Okay. It's more for my information um, than yours. Um, so again, when we take a look, is there, a, is there actually a change with, um, uh, with diet? Absolutely, a number of studies have actually shown this. In human twin studies, if one twin is eating one diet and another twin is eating another, um, if you're eating a high fat diet, uh, you might switch uh, from bacterioides and increase in actinobacteria in those twins. And one of the things that happens is that as you switch from one species to another, it actually um, causes an inflammatory response uh, to be built up. Uh, and I've already mentioned the Turnbaugh paper as well in animal models. And that's a big issue. It's animal models. We get lots of data from animal models. All our stuff on inflammation and um, cytokines is from animal models. But animal models in humans don't translate. Right, so that uh, Wu et al. paper in 2011, um, that's been five years, and we haven't gotten the same kind of results in human studies that we have from animal studies. So um, I'm gonna come back to this again on Monday, uh, just to review this. Um, obesity, as I mentioned, is accompanied by low levels of inflammation that we call meta-inflammation. And we know that meta-inflammation uh, involves a number of different cytokines and that I just showed you that changes in the bacterial uh, types, the enterotypes, can cause an increased production of things like interleukin, uh, sorry, interleukin-1 beta, TNF-alpha, as well. Another um, source of inflammation is this chemokine CC motif ligand 2 or CCL2. That's something that you should know is a marker for inflammation as well. And in addition to that, your immune system itself comes on when you change your bacteria as you change your diet and you change your gut uh, microbiome. Mast cells become activated, T cells become activated, and macrophages in the gut also uh, become much more activated um, as well. So why, why do we spend so much time talking about the effect of diet? We know that if, in theory, some of you who are eating that probiotic, one of the things that's laced in there is this bifidobacteria. The bifidobacteria, again, if you believe the animal studies, can change the animal gut microbiome within a day. And in bifidobacterium, um, actually has been shown to decrease inflammation. So is it good for you to take in bifidobacterium? In theory, at least according to animal models, if you have inflammation, you want to increase the level of um, bifidobacterium, uh, especially if you have um, obesity. And in obese mice, replacing it with um, bifidobacterium is actually shown to reverse some of the inflammation, some of these different markers that are up here. Um, and one of the ways that we can see if the gut itself is doing well is to uh, look for intestinal permeability. I'm gonna come back and mention intestinal permeability in a little bit more detail on uh, Monday. Part of the reason I'm going through um, uh, different parts of this today is you need to know some of this for your uh, lecture on Monday, uh, sorry, your tutorial on Monday as well. So again, 
if we take a look, all the stuff that, that, that we are talking about, if we change your diet, can we change your bacteria? If we change your bacteria, can we change your infl inflammatory status? If we change your inflammatory status, can we change um, how you feel? And it turns out that um, if we're delivering these probiotics, whether it's bifidobacteria or lactobacilli, um, we can, in theory, change um, the inflammatory status. And in some instances, again, it's in an animal model, uh, this led to fat invulnerability. What this means is that um, just like we saw with the P75 receptor last week, if you give animals lactobacillus uh, paracaceae and you let that dominate in their gut and you feed them a high fat diet, they don't get fat, at least according to this uh, P loss one study back in 2010 and in animal models. We don't know if that happens in humans. In humans, it hasn't been um, as successful nor as clear cut. So there are many, many caveats to when someone says you can change your diet and you can change the bacterial species like lactobacillus or bifidobacteria, you can um, get rid of obesity. There are lots of caveats. Most of those uh, types of information come from animal studies that don't really um, translate well in humans. Um, as I mentioned to you before, you have commensal bacteria that live inside of you, and these commensal bacteria normally keep other bad bacteria sort of um, at bay. Um, one of those really bad bacteria that in theory can colonize your gut and um, is really bad for you is this uh, Clostridium uh, difficile. And this Clostridium difficile um, causes uh, CDAD or Clostridium difficile associated disease, which you will hear about in your readings on for Monday and you will get tested on this. And one of the bad things about this is this particular bacteria that lives in your gut, if it's growing out of control, actually it's hard for us to get rid of it. So the best antibiotics that we have like vancomycin um, and others, uh, we can't get rid of it. It stays there. You're on antibiotics, all the bacteria is being wiped out except for this one. And it stays there even with um, antibiotic treatment because it tends to be resistant to even the most powerful ones that we have now. And so this idea is to take in other probiotics, just like with um, pimply skin, and to replace it with something that could uh, normally compete out for this uh, Clostridium difficile. Because one of the bad things is that this bacteria releases a, a toxin, and you always feel really bloated, and your and your joints don't feel really good. Um, oftentimes, it leads to intestinal dress, distress uh, in forms of um, diarrhea and other things, and it's not a pleasant system uh, to have around, and you can't get rid of it. And so it becomes a, a really big uh, issue and a lifestyle issue for a lot of individuals. So this gets into um, the next lecture. And all of these things that affect your gut microbiome, the last thing that we were not aware of until 2016 uh, was whether or not you could actually um, change the different types of bacteria through high fat uh, sorry, through high fiber diets. And these high fiber diets now tend to be really important. So uh, in the past, you've seen sort of uh, high protein diets or high protein containing foods, low fat. But now you're going to see more and more whenever you go to the store, high fiber diets and um, things that are supplemented with high fiber for precisely this reason um, that we'll go through. If you're on a low fiber diet, at some point, you can recover a lot of the gut microbiome, but as it gets passed on from generation to generation, at one point, you can't go back. And at some point, um, the diversity of your gut microbiome and all the good things that it produces uh, will be lost. Um, so uh, I mentioned at the very bottom of the um, slide related to CDAD, C. difficile, one of the things that we can't do really well is to wipe it out using um, the antibiotics like uh, vancomycin, right? So one of the ways to do this is to actually replace the bacteria. You could try probiotics, works. You could try prebiotics, the things that allow bacteria to grow, and they may or may not work. It's, there hasn't been a lot of success. However, um, this paper that came out or this article related to a paper that came out last week um, in January um, actually shows that human trials will be used uh, to test freeze-dried poop um, as a way to reduce weight. 
And one of the things that we know, if, um, if you have C. difficile infections and the antibiotics aren't working, what do you think the treatment is? Yes. Transplant fecal matter. Who do you get the fecal matter transplant from? Like you call up your mom and dad. Actually, no, you don't call up your mom and dad. Don't, don't call your mom and dad and ask them for that. That, that wouldn't be cool. Uh, actually, it has to be someone who lives with you. So uh, your wife, uh, people that eat and do the same things as you, those are the um, individuals that you want the fecal transplants from. Um, so, so I contacted this company, and how many of you would actually try uh, a fecal transplant? No? No? Fecal transplant? You'd eat freeze-dried poop? They, they made it delectable. They put mint in and everything else. Anyone? Anyone? Uh, I'll try it with you. Anyone? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, no? okay. Okay. All right, well, af after me. Okay, if you wanna, I'll just, I'm not gonna throw it. <laughs> they, they're really light, so, okay. Okay, so they're really, you know, it's just freeze-dried poop, nothing bad. They made it really tasty and everything else, and it tastes pretty good, right? Actually, they're just Tic Tacs, it's okay. Don't worry about it. Um, so um, that wasn't a really good troll. So let me, let me try to troll you a, a slightly different way. If you want some Tic Tacs, they're up here at the front at the end, by the way. What you really wanted to know was what's going to be on the midterm. Am I right about that? Not really. No? Yes? Kind of. Um, so here's a, here's a sample of the type of question that I'll be asking you, and you can take a picture of it if you want. That's it. That's all you get. Not very informative, right? So that was, um, yeah, there's, there's nothing there. That's right. Uh, so that really sucked. And so we'll, we'll try that again. And this is something that um, you will see. I'm not going to give you the whole question. You will get this question. Um, but this is um, something for you to think about, maybe talk about, maybe discuss a little bit. Um, you've seen this mouse before, and this is the type of question that I'm going to ask you a little bit about. It might not be, by the way, OB-OB. It might be, and again, here's a little hint, it might be something related to OB-OB that we went into class at around the same time. What might he um, observe in these mice? Hopefully that's a little bit better for all of you, right? Um, so I'm going to also say that this is um, also a type that you're going to be seeing um, a little bit more of. So yes, we talk a lot about bacteria, and you're, you are going to go through a couple of these with your t uh, TAs in your tutorial. So on Monday, you're going to go to your tutorial. You're going to uh, go through and get back your quiz. You will hear like what they were looking for in the answers on your quiz. You will go through the readings for this week, and then uh, you will also um, have a quiz there, and before you do the quiz, they're going to give you some sample questions for you to think about for your midterm as well. We want to get you ready slowly. We know that you're probably not studying nothing but HMB 204 all the time, right? As much as I hope that you are. Um, and so uh, we're going to ask you to start thinking about this uh, really slowly. Do you have any questions about this before we sort of wrap things up? No? Um, for those of you who are looking for a little extra fiber in your diet today, I have a couple of things for you at the front, and uh, if you want to help yourselves, and there are some uh, Tic Tacs for you up here as well.